Welcome back, everyone, to episode three of Napoleon in Egypt. If you have not seen the first two episodes of my reaction, the link's in the description, as well as a link to the original content. Definitely encourage you to check out the content without my commentary and then come back for additional insight. So let's go ahead and dive into part three. This is Death on the Nile. French ship Toulon, Aboukir Bay, August 1st, 1798. Away from the flames! Come about! Yells Captain Dupatit Fuaz. The British under Admiral Nelson had hit them just before dusk, initiating a bloody night battle and somehow getting behind the French defensive line. Dupatit Thuaz had pulled out of line to engage the British ship Majestic, pounding it to splinters, but at great cost, as return fire severed both of his arms and one of his legs. Mm. Now, he sits upright in a bucket filled with grain, directing his crew with bloody stumps. Get Think about the... Uh, maybe he's just in shock and he's able to overcome that temporarily, but just the fact that he's even alive after having both arms blown off and a leg but he's still sitting there giving orders. I don't know what ends up with this story, but I feel like with the medical profession where it is in the late 1700s, I don't feel like he's gonna survive this. Distance, away, away! Their flagship, the Orient, is afire, and Toulon is too close. If the flames were to reach the magazine, it could... A white flame fills the sky. The crew turns stunned, the Orient is gone. Dupatit Thuaz tells them to shake it off and continue the fight. In fact, his last order is to nail the colors to the mast, signaling there'll be no surrender. Hmm. Two days later, when the surviving crew finally- Why does that mean no surrender? Because you can't lower the flag in order to be able to raise another one. And you know, there are instances of similar stories throughout history of people doing things to signify that there's no going back from this. There's very famously, and. How much of it is exactly true, who knows, but the very famous story of uh, Cortez having his men burn all of their ships so that they can't go back, uh, that kind of thing. Finally give up, the French fleet has been destroyed. Napoleon may rule Egypt, true, but it is Nelson who rules the waves. Rule Britannia. Thanks so much to 80,000 Hours for sponsoring this episode. If you're looking for a career path that can have a positive impact on the world, then stick around until after the episode because they just might be able to help you find your dream job for free. After the Battle of the Pyramids on July 21st, 1798, Napoleon marched on Cairo, becoming master of Egypt. Then, as he had done in other places like Malta and Alexandria, he immediately went about reforming the city on the new French model. He set up local directories, councils basically, in towns and villages. He set up courts that made declarations granting more rights and freedoms to women. He enlisted Egyptian Copts, a local sect of Christianity, to fulfill their already prominent role as administrators and financial workers. So Coptic Christianity has long been, I think it's pretty much always been the dominant form of Christianity in Egypt. Um, so you can see again the influence of Julius Caesar and of the Roman Empire on how Napoleon is going about certain things. Uh, you know, going in and conquering, but then working with them, but also instilling into them the French model of things, right? Just like the Romans trying to Romanize the different cultures, but also giving them some form of flexibility within their own culture. And finally, most importantly, he had the army gather together representatives of a very specific trade, bakers, who were immediately given a crash course on how to make a decent baguette because you have to focus on the hierarchy of needs. Am I right? I mean, what, am I going to eat my jambon bar on, like, wheat bread? Come on. Next. Listen, we make a lot of jokes here in America about French, the French and their baguettes, but in Europe as a whole, bread is much more a staple than it is here in the States, but especially in France. Uh, baguettes are really a big thing there. It's, it's pretty cool. Napoleon sent word to Al-Azir Mosque, summoning the highest ranking clerics to his presence. When they came before him, he saw that they were all pale. Some even shook. They feared they would be killed. <laughs> no, Napoleon burst out laughing. He told them to relax. He wasn't there to take their heads. He was there to make them the heads. He wanted a council to advise him in leading Egypt, and he wanted them to do it. This actually appealed to them and was quite the savvy move by Bonaparte. Well, of course it appealed to them because they thought they were going to be executed. You know, and that's, look throughout history, right? 
there's a couple different ways you can do that when you conquer a territory, when you conquer a people. You can kill all their ringleaders, cut off the head, so to speak, and then instill your own people. You can try to rule directly and stay there for a while, or you can work within the system that exists. And, and so, yeah, they are expecting one thing and get another, so they feel like Napoleon's being generous to them. See, the Ottomans very specifically avoided entrusting political power to the Egyptians, and especially to local religious figures. And the whole reason they'd picked the Mamelukes as their ruling caste, slave soldiers brought in from the Caucasus with no local ties, was that they thought a foreign elite would be more loyal. And in the Ottoman Empire, civil figures ruled over religious ones. Further, the Ottomans had always insisted that their own clerics serve as final authority in interpreting religious law, so this was an opportunity for the scholars of Cairo to steer religion in Egypt. So Napoleon's tease of giving the clerics both civil power mm. and religious autonomy was so tempting that they decided to see how it played out. Napoleon, for his part, saw an alliance with Egyptian religious authorities as a way of keeping control of the country. This Hearts was 100% a cynical move, mind you, considering that the French Revolution itself had frequently cited organized religion as corrupt and immoral and insisted its institutions be secular. A yeah, the, that's a big part of the French Revolution. We've talked about that in videos about that, right? First, they go to the cult of the supreme being and then eventually even more secularized by going to the cult of reason. So they turn a lot of churches into temples of reason. Uh, go very, very secular. Officially, you could practice any religion you wanted in private, but it was supposed to be kept out of the government and the public sphere. Unofficially, though, religion was often looked down upon, and the Revolutionary Army was famous for sacking and despoiling heavily Catholic regions, even within France. However, Napoleon was pragmatic. While he personally looked down on religion, he also considered it an excellent tool to manipulate people. And that was exactly what he tried to do releasing numerous statements about his great respect for Islam and its compatibility with French ideals. And he needed that support, because oh boy was he in trouble. Napoleon was chasing the forces of Ibrahim Bey towards Syria when he got the news that his fleet had been destroyed and he was effectively trapped in Egypt. The one small mercy here was that the French fleet had at least damaged Nelson's ships badly enough that he couldn't stay in the area, going back to a friendly port to refit and drop off the multiple ships he'd captured. Though back in the negative column, the destruction of the Orient had sent the treasure of Malta, which was supposed to fund this whole Egyptian expedition, to the bottom of the bay. Oh and boy, that's brutal. So listen, all throughout Napoleon's time in as a general and later on as an emperor, uh, the, the British Navy is going to be kind of the bane of his existence. If he had had a navy that could have destroyed the British or at least kind of been on even terms with them, the whole Napoleonic War landscape looks different. Uh, and a lot of the mistakes that Napoleon will make later and a lot of the defeats that he and his generals will suffer are directly tied to the fact that the British and their allies had naval supremacy. To add insult to injury, the British also captured a cache of mail headed back to France, which included several letters of French officers and savants talking about how miserable they all were, and a letter from Napoleon himself to his wife Josephine, where he lividly cursed her out for carrying on an affair while he was gone. Oh, yeah, the British published all of those. Like, cold. Oh, yeah, listen, the British were, during the Napoleonic Wars, they were experts at propaganda. They used everything they could to drum up propaganda. This is where you constantly get uh, them harping on Napoleon's height. He was average height for the time. Things like that. Bloodedly showed all the receipts. With this defeated sea, Bonaparte now found his supply lines, communications channels, and evacuation route to France had all essentially been cut. And he hadn't even fully defeated the base. Ibrahim was waiting in Syria with his army, and Murad had started a guerrilla insurgency in Upper Egypt. Modern French tactics were far less effective in this fast-moving type of war, and commanders quickly found that in a battle of cavalry versus cavalry, the Mameluk horsemen were more than a match for them. But also, Murad and Ibrahim were playing the long game. See, years before, the pair, who'd governed Egypt on behalf of the Ottomans but were semi-autonomous, had actually revolted against Ottoman rule and been exiled after an invasion. But back then, they'd simply waited until the Ottomans had a different insurgency on their hands and mm. then struck a deal with them to return to power. They figured all they had to do here was kind of the same thing. Wait for Napoleon to fail and then come roaring back. So and this is what you have to do against a 
an enemy that has the numbers and has the technology, you just got to wait them out. That's what the American army does uh, against the British during the Revolutionary War. The United States was never going to win the war on the battlefield going toe-to-toe with the British army. It was, as Hamilton describes it, it was about out, uh, outwit, outlast, hit them quick, and get out fast. Uh, you know, make them suffer so many casualties and so much money and cost poured into this thing that they finally decide it's not worth it. Uh, and so you're going to do the same thing here. It's going to be a war of attrition. Napoleon wins the quick victories, but you can wait him out. So Napoleon doubled down on trying to make Egypt into a secure long-term position. He tried to become an Ottoman-style ruler in a way that would appeal to Egyptians, leading the festivities at the annual Festival of the Nile and the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. He even sponsored a dinner symposium among Cairo's religious scholars, where he appeared in a turban and a robe, declaring himself the champion of the prophet, and claiming he wanted to unite all wise people under one regime founded on the principles of the Quran. Yeah. When one scholar told him the best way to get Egyptians to accept his rule would actually be for him and his army to convert, Napoleon did briefly consider whether he'd take that step. Eventually, though, he turned it down. Tactfully, of course, saying that his soldiers would not accept it. They liked their wine, after all, and, you know, probably wouldn't agree to mass circumcision. And I think at this point... Islam forbids the drinking of alcohol, so yeah, they weren't going to give that up. Um, but it was all. this is all about being practical, and I think it seems like what Napoleon's trying to do here is kind of basically setting himself up a little kingdom over in Egypt. Uh, and it sounds like maybe he plans on sticking around a while. Because remember, this is before he has taken charge in France, which is going to come after this. Uh, but right now, his ambition is all about how can I gain the most power and influence and where is that going to happen? Right now, it's Egypt, but then it's going to be France. Point. It's important to be very clear. This entire thing was a political dance. Napoleon faked an interest in Islam and the scholars pretended to believe him. But meanwhile, he tightened his grip. At first, he'd promised to do away with the Mameluke high taxes, but now he implemented them for his own benefit. He extracted tithes and fines from the wives of Mameluke officials that returned to Cairo and investigated taxing pilgrim caravans. He also ruled with fear. In one letter, he casually mentioned that he was beheading five to six people a day in Cairo. And Cairo citizens felt general discomfort living under Christian rulers. They complained to each other that the French were dirty, tyrannical, that they favored Christians over Muslims, and that they sexually assaulted women, raiding harems to kidnap slave girls as their concubines. Mm. And though they claimed to be anti-slavery, officers were still buying men and women at slave markets. Then, low-level resistances plagued the French in Cairo. Bedouins kidnapped and killed soldiers. Upper-class citizens avoided Napoleon's public appearances. The French quickly learned not to walk off alone, and the revolts in Lower Egypt kept the army tied down. Heck, even the French-trained bakers weren't safe. Mobs actually chased them off and smashed their ovens. <laughs> so how long, if you're Napoleon, are you going to hang on to power and influence when your own army and your own officers start saying, this is not working? We, we can't do this. It, it, the people are turning against us. They don't accept our rule. Our men are being taken into alleys and, and killed. Uh, once you lose the support of your army, you, you're done. Then, on October 21st, rallied by a manifesto calling for all French to be killed, Cairo rose up. Mobs filled the streets, setting up barricades and attacking soldiers. The revolt centered around Al-Azir Mosque, where thousands of students joined the combat, and peasants, used to being mobilized by Ottoman armies, took up weapons as well. The French then stationed cannons atop the city's highest tower and bombarded the rebel-held districts. Later that night, Napoleon pushed out into the city, French soldiers fighting house to house and destroying mm. barricades. And by the next morning, he had the whole city apart from Al-Azir Mosque itself. The people inside called for God to help them, with Napoleon supposedly responding, he is too late. French cannons smashed the walls, opening gaps, then French troops stormed in. According to his memoir, General Alexandre Dumas led that assault. However, in later paintings, the general, then out of favor, was replaced by Napoleon himself. You know, and that kind of thing happens in history as well, too. You've seen things like... Uh, I think it was Joseph Stalin who, when people would fall out of favor, he'd have them basically, what was the 1930s version of Photoshop, Photoshop them out of the pictures uh, and, and either replace them or just leave it blank. 
Uh, same kind of thing happens here when you're when you're close and you're in favor with the guy, man, the sky is the limit. But as soon as you fall out of favor, and that kind of happened with um, Lafayette at different times, depending on who was in charge and depending on who the connections were that he had with them. When the smoke cleared, 6,000 citizens of Cairo lay dead wow. or wounded. And one thought plagued Napoleon's mind. I have got to get out of here. Which is a sentiment I'm betting a few of you out there have felt at least once or twice in your life. With so, yeah, and we're going to talk about that in the next episode, but it's really fascinating to think about the fact that Napoleon basically abandons his army and then ends up, in a sense, being rewarded for it by getting charge in France, uh, getting to take charge there. So it's fascinating. It's amazing to me that he was able to lead massive armies for the next 15 years after basically abandoning his army in Egypt to be left to their own devices. So we'll see what happens. We'll come back with the next episode tomorrow. Thanks for watching.